Welcome to today's plenary session, which will be followed by the Continue the Conversation session. Please welcome Dr. Jose Diaz Gomez. Hello, I am Jose Diaz Gomez, and it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Pete Alexander, who will present this year's Mask Harry Well Memorial Lecture. Dr. Alexander is an Australian trained intensive care physician and pediatric cardiologist with expertise in the management of advanced heart failure and mechanical circulatory support. She's an assistant professor in pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and a staff physician in the Department of Cardiology at Boston Children's Hospital. She is the cardiac extracorporeal membrane oxygenation program medical director with a focus on optimizing potential circulatory support strategies for patients with congenital and acquired heart disease. She strives for interdisciplinary, goal-concordant, family-oriented, family-centered care. She's also the treasurer of the board directors of ELSO, co-chair of PD ECMO and the Pediatric ECMO Anticoagulation Collaborative Piece, and is an associate editor of Pediatric Critical Care Medicine Journal. Today, Dr. Alexander will present what has COVID-19 told us about ECMO. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pita Alexander. I'd like to thank the organisers of the Critical Care Congress of the Society of Critical Care Medicine for the invitation and the honour of giving the Max Harry Wheel Memorial Lecture this year. The topic is what has COVID-19 taught us about ECMO? These are my disclosures. As we think about what COVID-19 has taught us about ECMO, it seems relevant to review what we were already learning about ECMO at the time the pandemic arrived. ECMO is a form of modified cardiopulmonary bypass in which venous blood is removed from the body and pumped through an artificial membrane lung in patients who have respect refractory respiratory or cardiac failure. The nomenclature of ECMO support was clarified in these papers summarizing international expert opinion. The circuit itself consists of a respiratory membrane through which oxygen is added and carbon dioxide removed and blood is returned to the patient either via another vein to provide respiratory support or via a major artery to provide circulatory support. ECMO is a resource-intensive, highly specialised and expensive form of life support with the potential for significant complications, particularly including bleeding, clotting and infection. ECMO wasn't a new therapy introduced during the COVID-19 pandemic. Evolving from the first uses of heart-lung bypass procedures, ECMO utilisation has been established as rescue therapy for the most critically ill neonates and children with cardiopulmonary failure. The CESAR trial, the efficacy of economic assessment of conventional ventilatory support versus ECMO for severe adult respiratory failure trial, was an RCT which found significantly lower mortality or severe disability at six months in patients who were assigned to receive care at an ECMO centre compared to those who uh, receive their care in non-ECMO centres. The reporting of results in 2009 coincided with improvements in circuit technologies and overall was associated with increased ECMO availability at a number of centres. The advent of the H1N1 pandemic in 2009 to 2011 also saw increases in ECMO utilisation, with some causal inference observational studies supporting the potential benefit in selected populations with reversible disease before the Aeolia study uh, was reported in 2018. This is the largest randomized control trial of VV ECMO for severe ARDS, and it demonstrated a potentially large, but not statistically significant mortality benefit of ECMO over conventional management, 35% mortality at 60 days versus 46% mortality in those who didn't receive ECMO, with acceptable rates of adverse events. These results, along with a post-hoc Bayesian analysis of Aeolia, help to establish criteria for ECMO in severe ARDS, refractory to conventional management. By 2020, ECMO was largely accepted as an option to support selected patients with respiratory failure, 
overlying the timeline with the number of adult respiratory ECMO runs reported to the ELSO registry over time demonstrates the evolution and the use of the support in the lead up to the pandemic. The inclusion criteria for the Aeolia study have become a proxy uh, criteria for clinical care. The World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a public health emergency of international concern on March 11, 2020, and released interim guidelines on patient management. Early reports that emerged from Wuhan, the epicenter of the outbreak, demonstrated that the clinical manifestations of the infection were fever, cough, and dyspnea with radiological findings consistent with viral pneumonia. The WHO interim guidelines made general recommendations for treatment of ARDS in this setting, including consideration of referring patients with refractory hypoxemia to expert centres capable of providing ECMO. Doctors McLaren, Fisher and Brody, uh, well known in the ECMO community, wrote this paper very early in the pandemic, making the point that ECMO is not a therapy to be rushed to the front line when all resources are stretched in a pandemic. Support with ECMO is for the most critically ill patients in regions with extensive resources required to provide this therapy. In less well-resourced countries, many more lives will be saved by ensuring oxygen and pulse oximetry are widely available, they stated. Mitigation efforts to slow the outbreak are critical so that healthcare systems are not overwhelmed and all patients receive the correct management, whether simply confirmation of the diagnosis and appropriate quarantine oxygen therapy alone, mechanical ventilation, or for those most likely to benefit, perhaps ECMO. Even at this stage of the global pandemic, the authors recognised that information is power in any response and advocated for mobilisation of existing registries and clinical networks to facilitate the systematic collection of data. This was a call to action. The COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in unprecedented data availability and visualisation, much of it open access and front-facing to healthcare workers, policymakers and the wider public. In addition to the earliest available case numbers and mortality in aggregate, interactive data visualisation to target countries and regions has been available. This is the interface that many of you will recognise from John Hopkins' coronavirus resource centres, but there are many others, including some... Um, provided through the World Health Organization, CDC, NIH, and beyond. The ECMO community response to the pandemic also included changes to how data was collected, shared, and presented. For example, this uh, is a representation from the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization, the ELSO registry, which has collated data from more than 170,000 patients supported with ECMO since the mid-1980s. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the registry added a real-time COVID addendum and asked centres to change the way data was collected, to enter data at the point they recognised the patient had COVID and then complete the record once the patient had achieved any potential outcomes. Collated, de-identified patient characteristics and outcomes are available at the reference website and updated daily. In addition to primary COVID addenda, the ELSO registry with input from Pediacma Research Collaborative added some specific questions for the pediatric community. Since the beginning of the pandemic, some 386 neonates and children have received ECMO for SARS-CoV-2. But with the overwhelming population supported with ECMO during the pandemic presenting as adults with respiratory or cardiorespiratory failure, this population will form the rest of this presentation. Euro also, the collaborative European ECMO centres, also moved quickly to capture ECMO utilisation, patient characteristics and outcomes data as the COVID-19 moved through contributing countries. While Australia and New Zealand took advantage of their geographic isolation and were protected from the early waves of the pandemic, a group of researchers established ECMO Card and the COVID-19 Critical Care Consortium to collect data through extensive collaboration with interprofessional organisations, including ASARIC, the International Severe Acute Respiratory Emerging Infection Consortium. And these are just examples of the largest international registries collecting ECMO data and outcomes during the pandemic. Local, regional and national collaboratives evolved to share protocols, processes, regional capacity and ECMO equipment management. These continue to inform the field and have changed the way ECMO is delivered around the world.
leveraging that available data and resulting publications, let's take a look at the use of ECMO during the COVID-19 pandemic. With so much unknown early in the pandemic, the safety of ECMO provision to the critically ill needed to be established. While many patients supported on ECMO do undergo other aerosol generating procedures as part of their care, the ECMO circuit and oxygenator did not appear to be a source of the spread of SARS-CoV-2 in this very early study out of Paris. They looked at 25 patients from three ICUs in Paris, including two different oxygenators in the ECMO circuit, and demonstrated that although uh, the 25 patients receiving ECMO had positive SARS-CoV-2 respiratory samples, 13 had positive plasma samples, all samples tested negative from, the, this, from scavenging the ECMO membrane. As a healthcare community, we focused on appropriate utilisation of PPE, sharing protocols for escalation and education, and simulation to ensure provider safety during procedural and bedside aspects of care. It was thus recognised early that ECMO was safe to the healthcare workers, but was it of benefit to the patients? In these early reports of critically ill populations with COVID-19 in China, it was revealed that a total of 17 patients uh, who received ECMO who had outcome data, 14 died. Despite the early um, poor outcomes reported, initial guidance documents um, included reference to the provision of ECMO cannulation. Uh, this from the first affiliated hospital for, for the Zhejiang School of Medicine in China. ECMO was also referenced as a suggestion in the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines on the management of critically ill adults with coronavirus disease 2019. And clinical ECMO experts in the provision of ECMO were paired with Dr. Bartlett to compile the initial ELSO guidance document for ECMO for COVID-19 patients with severe cardiopulmonary failure. This document included an algorithm modelled on the suggested utilisation for ECMO for, on ECMO for ARDS in adults, which remained relevant for the updated ELSO guidelines in 2021. Without paediatric or congenital heart disease specific guidelines, my centre was amongst many who derived uh, equivalent algorithms for care, identifying those particularly at high risk for deterioration and early consideration of ECMO in order to avoid um, cardiopulmonary arrest. We're very happy to share these if you'd like to see. Leveraging the uh, available data, let's have a look at the use of ECMO during the COVID-19 pandemic. This retrospective single region five ICU hospital network study reported the results of 83 patients who received ECMO for severe ARDS associated with COVID-19. The centres leveraged the AOLIO trial inclusion criteria and patients received standardised ECMO and ICU care. Compared to the earlier reports with 84 to 100% mortality following ECMO for this disease, the authors reported an estimated 31% probability of 60-day post-cannulation mortality, which is consistent with the previous AOLIA trial results, 35%, and the larger prospective lifeguard registry, 39% at 180 days. In this report of ECMO use in the Greater Paris region, including 17 ECMO centres serviced by six mobile ECMO transport teams, the authors provide much detail about the local network organisation, patient selection and provision of ECMO care, starting in these graphs with the sourcing of additional ECMO pumps from other centres and in industry, along with the timeline of the first wave of COVID-19 in the region. The authors provide their detailed network planning, agreed upon indication criteria for ECMO support in this disease, as well as proportion of patients approved for ECMO transport. This hub and spoke model of ECMO provision is a sophisticated example of something which evolved in many regions over the course of the pandemic. The outcomes of the 302 ECMO patients were also shared in this publication. The authors noticed that that despite guideline-managed ECMO anticoagulation, circuit thrombosis occurred in 10% of the patients and pulmonary emboli were diagnosed in 18%. At 90 days after ECMO initiation, 46% of the cohort were alive. In a multivariable time-to-mortality analysis, increasing age, pre-ECMO renal dysfunction, time between intubation and ECMO cannulation, and centre volume less than 30 in the previous year, were associated with worse outcome. 
the implications that the authors considered important were that with central regulation and pooling of resources on a regional level, VV ECMO was an effective ECMO technique for managing patients with refractory COVID-19 related ARDS in Greater Paris. As a strong volume outcome effect was observed, VV ECMO should preferably be performed in high volume expert centres potentially with mobile ECMO teams capable of cannulating patients in remote intensive care units and transferring them to ECMO centres. In this study, with data from the ELSA registry submitted by 213 experienced ECMO centres from 36 countries, um, 1,035 patients with COVID-19 received ECMO support. The patient characteristics and pre-ECMO treatment listed here were similar to those in the Aeolia trial. The estimated cumulative incidence of in-hospital mortality 90 days after the initiation of ECMO was also similar to that reported in ECMO-supported patients at the Aeolia trial, 37.5%. Not surprisingly, many of these patients survived the critical illness, ARDS and ECMO support in the study, and many patients were transferred to either rehabilitation or long-term acute care facilities for recovery. In this early large multi-centre study, increasing patient age, circulatory support for cardiovascular dysfunction were associated with the patient outcome of mortality. In this report from the ECMO VIBA study, a regional collaboration of ECMO programs on the Iberian Peninsula, the authors report on 319 consecutive patients supported with ECMO for COVID-19 associated ARDS from 24 ECMO centres during the study period of March to December 2020. Of the patients, 180 were successfully decannulated with a median duration of ECMO run of 17 days, more than a quarter of whom were managed on ECMO for greater than 30 days. Survival to hospital discharge was 49% and was found to be higher. Mortality was found to be higher in the second wave of COVID-19 in the region. Patient factors of advancing age, some comorbidities, second wave of um, COVID-19 infection and hospital centre volume were associated with the outcome of patient survival to hospital discharge. So the early findings of patient outcomes following ECMO support for COVID-19 associated ARDS were reassuringly similar to pre-COVID reports, with the particular findings of overall mortality for well-selected patients was consistent with what had previously been reported. Improved mortality and mortality outcome was present for those with lower age, less cardiovascular dysfunction, and improved mortality outcome appeared to be associated with larger volume centres. This was These were true in reports from smaller regional studies and single centres, as well as in the large international registries. In this updated report from the ELSO registry, including 4,812 patients with COVID-19 who received ECMO across 349 global centres within 41 countries, the authors describe patient population and time to in-hospital mortality outcome according to defined patient groups. Group A1 include those patients supported in established centres with ECMO um, commenced before the 1st of May 2020. Group A2 represents patients supported in established centres from May till December 2020. And Group B is patients supported in centres that were late adopters of ECMO. There were few differences in patient or care characteristics, but there was an important difference in uh, cumulative incidence of in-hospital mortality over 90 days after ECMO initiation. This was lower in patients who received ECMO prior to the 1st of May, those in the blue line, compared to those in the second wave, 52% um, of whom died, uh, were, even when they were treated in the same sorts of centres as the first wave population. Mortality was even higher at 59% for patients who were supported in centres who were late adopters of ECMO as therapy for this disease. Uh, 
This report from the Euro ALSO Euro ECMO survey confirmed the previously reported findings of increased mortality when ECMO was used to support patients with COVID-19 related to ARDS in the second wave of the pandemic. They also demonstrate the increased duration of ECMO support during the second wave, which has major implications for ICU and ECMO capacity. You can see that while the first wave in 2020 um, peaked with ECMO support and then declined, the second wave seems to just carry on with lots of ECMO-supported patients for many days. So the evolving nature of ECMO support of COVID-19 pandemic, including reported increased mortality over the course of the pandemic and increased duration of ECMO runs over time, warrants ongoing monitoring and may inform decision-making for strategies of support during times of ECMO constraint, of resource constraint. The other important features of ECMO, which were clear after the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, is that there were more thrombotic complications in these patients with an increased anticoagulation requirement. And in the setting of therapeutic immunosuppression, there was more infection. A higher proportion of these patients had right heart failure than was typically recognised in ARDS. Despite the concerning findings of increased mortality in the second wave and beyond, there's still many studies which show a perceived benefit of ECMO therapy. This is one of them. In this study from the UK, including 111 referral centres to two specialised ECMO centres, um, the authors promote a survival benefit of ECMO in severe COVID-19 using a multi-centre propensity match cohort study. In this propensity score matched analysis, there were 1,363 patients, including 263 who received ECMO and 209 propensity match controls. The authors report a marginal odds ratio for mortality of 0.44 with confidence intervals of 0.29 to 0.68 and an absolute mortality reduction of 18.2% for treatment with ECMO in a specialised centre. In this single centre study out of the Vanderbilt ECMO program, they used granular local data to review all patient referrals to the single centre between January 1, 2021 and August 31, 2021. The authors considered patients eligible for ECMO if they met the inclusion criteria for severe ARDS according to AOLIA criteria with none of the exclusion criteria of age greater than 60 days, BMI greater than 55, uh, prolonged duration of mechanical ventilation or irreversible end organ injuries. As medi medical eligibility was determined, there was a systematic assessment of the health system's resources to provide ECMO, that is equipment, personnel, ICU bed availability. When health system's resources were available, the patient was transferred to an ECMO centre, but with no availability, they were not transferred. There was no wait list. The two groups of patients who met criteria for ECMO support were compared for primary outcome. Of died before hospital discharge using Cox proportional hazard regression analysis, adjusting for patient age, acute kidney injury, and receipt of vasopressors. The characteristics of patients in each group were similar at the time of decision making as shown on the table. There was also no difference between the groups according to mechanical ventilation strategy or arterial blood gas results. But patient survival to hospital discharge, however, was impressively different between the groups, as shown in the graph depicting cumulative proportion of patients who died compared to days since ECMO referral. There was no interaction between ECMO health system capacity or hospital strain measured by two-week average hospitalizations or deaths in the state over the study period. The authors proposed that the benefits of a life support therapy can be difficult to estimate because there may be uh, there may no longer be equipoise for, provide, for providing or withholding a life support therapy, that trials assessing potential benefits of ECMO support have been confounded by concerns over equipoise, selection bias and crossover from the control group. While this natural experiment shows that among patients who are eligible for ECMO in one referral region, the health system capacity to provide ECMO was available for less than half the patients and mortality was 90% when the health system capacity to provide ECMO was not available compared to 43% when capacity was available 
So while ECMO has not been evaluated in the important and ongoing clinical trials of therapies during the pandemic, there are accumulating causal inference observational studies which suggest a survival benefit for well-selected patients in whom this invasive care is gold concordant. This adds to the challenges of conducting RCTs during the pandemic. There's a perceived lack of clinical equipoise to add to the lack of pre-existing organisation, infrastructure and funding, while the clinical care team was overwhelmed by the burden of critically ill patients. As the total ICU deaths from COVID-19 in the USA approaches 1 million patients, our ICU and ECMO team still feel it's far from normal. As a brief aside, I'd considered sharing the YouTube video of this parody of a public service announcement produced by the Australian Broadcasting Commission during the COVID-19 pandemic. A number of comedians and public personalities contributed, and the message was that mates don't let mates start podcasts. Despite this excellent and considered advice, we started a podcast. Much more conversational and with a side of medicine than many of the journal and professional organisation webinars, we heard direct from doctors Giovanna, Giovanna, Giovanna Colombo and Lorenzo Grazioli about life inside the COVID-19 first wave in Bergamo, Italy, and later from Dr. Sampania in New York City. While I was aware of some of the resource limitations during the H1N1 pandemic in 2009 and beyond, I didn't have a construct to think about the inundation of the critically ill population that was occurring in their region. I asked Dr. Grazioli to help me understand why all these people are dying. Why would some form of ECMO not help them? He said, currently, a 70-year-old with COVID-19 and no comorbidities is too old to be admitted to, our, to ICU in our hospital. We have an age limit of 60 for ECMO. Unfortunately, if we were in peacetime, half these patients would be on ECMO. And with his response, it's clear that crisis standards of care with daily resource limitation were in place. Since early in the pandemic, debate, discussion and enunciation of the ethical principles and associated processes which should guide the allocation of scarce resources um, as these become limited in the pandemic have become available. The guiding principles of maximising benefits, equity, priority for healthcare workers who may benefit others during the pandemic have all been proposed. This is only one of the summary articles, but there are many. The principles and processes to guide uh, resource allocation were an important update to the 2021 ELSO guidelines for COVID-19. Before ECMO capacity becomes saturated within a given region, they recommended that these ECMO networks adapt unified patient exclusion criteria at a regional level to promote equitable access to ECMO and avoid the need for transferring centres to make referrals to multiple ECMO centres. They provided this algorithm, uh, which documents that even after ECMO indications are met, that there's a second patient selection strategy step and after that step, a further step assessing ECMO capacity. Conventional capacity is available. The patient moves straight through to ECMO, but they offer multiple capacity tiers through to crisis capacity where additional ECMO cannulations are simply not feasible um, and ECMO uh, resources needed to be repurposed. It's no wonder then that the healthcare workforce and particularly the ECMO workforce is feeling overwhelmed by the ongoing pandemic. In this national cross-sectional survey of healthcare workers in Qatar, the authors aim to assess the development of burnout in the ICU and any relationship as to whether the clinician worked in a unit which offered ECMO. They used an online questionnaire, the Maslach Burnout Inventory Human Services Survey for medical personnel to assess intensive care practitioners across five tertiary hospitals, including eight ICUs. They found that the overall prevalence of burnout is high in ICUs with almost two thirds of practitioners meeting criteria for diagnosis. Burnout was not less prevalent in ICUs with ECMO provided, and indeed the personal accomplishment scales were lower in those who provided ECMO. When the authors looked at specific healthcare worker factors associated with the diagnosis of burnout, they did find a higher association when the worker have personally been infected with COVID-19 or knew someone who had, 
Of note, providers satisfied with their compensation appeared less burnout, less prone to burnout, which may be a message to administrators everywhere. Health, healthcare worker grief is associated with burnout and distress as bereaved healthcare workers strive to balance caring professional identities and evolving work responsibilities. In this review paper, the authors can suggest that burnout itself may be the direct result of an inability to integrate inevitable mounting losses into an ongoing career and life. As busy clinicians move on to the next, grief compounds and the consequences of unprocessed grief accumulates. The authors highlight eight ways that the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted professional grief. Obviously, there's a large number of ab large absolute number of deaths. Individuals may be deployed to different work environments. Understaffing may result in long hours without adequate breaks to refill the tank. Uncertainty about the pandemic course and when life will return to normal has affected us all. Moral distress is particularly prevalent. prevalent. The lack of usual engagement with patients and families is compounded by patients who are dying alone at the bedside. And the extremes of death and the potential impact on the number of deaths with the broader use of vaccines. They also mention family member restricted access at the end of life, which puts healthcare workers in a new and vulnerable place in the context of dying. The authors include a list of resources for reference for those coping with grief and loss. By the numbers presented in prior studies, many of us may benefit from engaging with some of those services. Please review the full list in the published paper if you think it might be of benefit to you. The authors also discuss the equivalent of emotional PPE. They suggest that healthcare workers recognise their responsibility to report the bereaved loved ones and patients, but also must attend to our own grief. To promote healthy grieving, both individual and system interventions are key to helping healthcare workers prepare for loss and supporting healthcare losses in their healthcare workers in their grief over the COVID-19 deaths of patients, colleagues, and families. In this paper, the authors the author um, suggests coping strategies in order to protect ourselves and our organisations during the ongoing pandemic. They break down the factors into individual, organisational and leadership structures. Individual interventions obviously include adequate rest and exercise, um, but some of the organisational structures may, may include um, factoring in some uh, a moment's silence, rest in peace or a prayer, something with which you find comfort. Debriefing as part, as part of your team if it can be supportive and moderated. Healthcare centre leadership must be communicative, responsive and express gratitude for their workers. Remember that we're all ECMO leaders uh, in our spaces and that means that we should be engaging in that mindset as well. Some centres have deliberately brought professional psychologists ethicists, counsellors into their ICUs to support the team. In my centre, we have frequent access to a clinical ethicist who sometimes joins clinical rounds but always joins bereavement meetings. We found this very helpful. So ECMO for COVID-19 then. At the end of the day, ECMO is a support strategy for the sickest patients with respiratory and cardiorespiratory failure. While inpatient care and early reports have focused on patient survival to hospital discharge, what does survival actually look like after an episode of care which includes ECMO? This small single centre study of post-hospitalisation outcomes after, COVID, after ECMO for COVID-19 in 24 survivors offers some reassuring findings. The patient population is reflective of those reported in other studies with essentially the same inclusion criteria for ECMO. At the time of hospital discharge, supplemental oxygen was common and some patients were discharged with tracheostomy and ventilation. Only 29% of patients were discharged directly home with almost half discharged to a rehabilitation center. At the time of follow-up, however, at two months to one year post ECMO decannulation, only two patients remained on supplemental oxygen. All of the other patients with tracheostomy had been decannulated and no patients required tube feeds. 
Using the Patient Reported Outcomes Measures Information System, patient reported outcomes were assessed at medium eight months post ECMO cannulation. You can see that patients reported relatively high levels of global physical function, and though there were a reported high incidence of fatigue, overall pain scores were low. From this small study, it appears that long-term outcomes in survivors of COVID-19 ARDS who received ECMO support are really promising with a very low rate of technological de dependence and high levels of global physical function. So what has COVID-19 taught us about ECMO? The pandemic has really brought ECMO to prime time. From a systems perspective, Accurate real-time data and analytic capability has facilitated recognition of the changing outcomes of COVID-19 patients who were supported on ECMO during the course of the pandemic. And they've informed educational, quality and academic webinars and publications. Communication and collaboration are essential to the global response to the pandemic and the, flattening, and the potential for flattening the curve sharing anecdotes before guidelines and guidelines before patient level data was available. Ongoing collaboration is facilitating high quality causal inference studies of the outcomes of ECMO utilization in this population and beyond. The evolution and strengthening of local, local net, networks and referral pathways, sharing capacity availability in ECMO equipment has allowed maximum benefits to benefit from this care. In a more ECMO-specific uh, way, COVID-19 has helped us realise that ECMO for well-selected patient population is moving beyond a rescue therapy, with a number of causal inference observational studies suggesting benefit of ECMO support. Care protocols should continue to be personalised, multidis multidisciplinary and goal concordant. An example specific to the use of ECMO during the COVID-19 pandemic relates to anticoagulation utilisation and the recognition that increased thrombosis was occurring in circuits, prompting increases in therapeutic targets for heparinization to meet the new demand. And finally, the early release of ECMO consensus-based guidelines highlighting the potential benefit of ECMO in this disease and some key recommendations for indications and clinical care of the ARDS patient on ECMO provided a sound strategy for centres, particularly inexperienced or new centres, to approach this resource-intensive support strategy. And finally, COVID-19 has brought the ECMO workforce uh, into the limelight. ECMO has always been a team sport, but the stresses associated with the pandemic, whatever the circumstances at home, busy clinical work, isolated patients, fear, have added a burden to our teams. Burnout in our workforce is common and worsened by the complexity of care in the pandemic, but there are individual, organisational and leadership actions which can impact the mental health and resilience of our workforce. Strategic implementation an investment will ensure that we have ECMO teams through the rest of the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. In my mind, the impact of ECMO centre volume on outcomes in this population is a direct reflection of the system's ECMO-specific protocols and ECMO and ICU workforce expertise at the bedside that's reflected on it by the silos on this slide. Through the experiences of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've learned a lot about supporting patients with ECMO, optimising ECMO delivery and monitoring trends and outcomes, which will form a powerful new baseline in the provision of ECMO support through the pandemic and beyond. 